clearly it's not easy to get from there to here. And so the permission is not granted to you easily uh, to go out and find your way through here. Um, and then, so does that make you feel less included or does that set me up as a speaker in a different way than if I were speaking at the ground level, showing slides like I often do in my classrooms? Um, so the, what the space can say about who we value, who's speaking, what kind of cultural um, experience that you're bringing and that you're experiencing um, is uh, part of the point that I'm trying to make of that interconnection. So it actually shapes behavior, right? So you're, you're reading all these messages about who has access, where's the focus of this room. And so you behave in a certain way because of that. Right? And so if you were to depart from that behavior, it would be seen probably by others as an aberration. And so it actually changes who feels like they're allowed to speak and when, and who is going to be made you know, visible versus kind of ignored or, or made invisible, and then who has choices to move or um, access spaces, and then how long are you um, welcome to stay to hang out versus waiting for something to happen. So all of these things, I think, relate to the talks that are going to be coming in this series. And so when you think about the typical um, dominant culture perception of sacred space, it is different than other cultures. And so I briefly mentioned indigenous cultures. But in the context of this lecture series, the uh, cultural context is the Asian cultures and Asian architecture. So the Gardner Center Saturday University series will include a number of other talks which will address um, many of the ideas that I'm introducing today. So I hope that if you are able to attend any or all of these, you begin to bring this lens about the cultural um, dimension of what you're seeing and how it's being presented to you here in Seattle of spaces that are uh, sometimes pretty far away from speakers that either themselves have a cultural background or do, or do not, and how that um, in the spaces that they're talking about. And so that can affect how what their lens is and what your lens is as you experience those lectures. So first, let's do some level setting when I'm switching now to talk more specifically about sacred space. So I've given you a lot of examples about um, space and its connection to culture. Um, and so now I'll just do some level setting to, to think about sacred space in particular. So if you're comfortable closing your eyes and, and thinking about a place or a space that you consider sacred. So this can be highly personal to you, to your family, your community, your history, or it can be a canonical space that you were taught in school or told, uh, visited on a tour, for example, that was designated as sacred or you were told that it was sacred. So if you take a few moments to create your own slideshow in your head, of a range of places that meet your definition of sacred. And think of as many examples as you can. So I'll give you here just like a two minutes. Hopefully you don't fall asleep as you're thinking of these sacred, peaceful spaces. All right, so I'll bring you back here so you can open your eyes. So keeping those images in mind, let's see how many of the following slides might match one or two or more of the images that you thought of. So think of this like a bingo game and see how many matches. So keep your own count of these and we'll tally up at the end. <laughs> 
Okay. So let's see how many images. So if, I, uh, if you're comfortable raising your hand, uh, can you say anyone that had two or more that matched or pretty close matches? Okay, how about four or more? All right, how about six or more? Eight or more? 10 or more? Whoa, okay, we got some people who really hit for that. So um, I hope you, you might, might or might not have noticed as I was going through them that those images were generated from Google image search. And I'll go back through, so I'll just name each one that was, uh, that was um, what the search was. So the search term for this one was, um, sorry, I can't even read it myself. Worship space, thank you. So Dan, maybe you can call them out for me. So worship space and... Asian temple, temple worship, sacred space, cathedral, modern sacred space, ancient sacred space. Right. So you could, you know, do whatever searches, but those are just what comes up, and you can see there's a range from buildings that are pretty, pretty formally designated to things that might, you might set up in your home, to places that have been uh, around for a long time, or things that are, um, I think in, somewhere in here there was a mega church as well, right? So there's things that um, represent kind of long held centuries old traditions of how one worships. And then there are other examples where it's um, a, a different, like I, I don't think, The mega church model and the kinds of music and lighting that happen there, um, the the Stonehenge people would not have recognized that as as sacred, or it would have been pretty shocking to them to think, what we're missing here are theater lights, right? So, so you can see there's a, a pretty wide range of what we consider to be sacred space, and or what Google at least considers to be sacred space, and the if I think about what's common in all of them. So we've got functions that happen that are pretty um, consistent, right? And whether or not you have a different definition of what you consider worship and what gods or what deities or what entities you're, um, or ancestral ancestors that you're worshiping, there's something about a worship or a, a place where you're thinking and honoring somehow. There's usually some aspect of ritual where uh, there are some sacred spaces where you have to wash hands and others where you wash feet and others where you enter into certain doors um, and some where you're entering with your head bowed, right? So there's a number of ritualistic aspects to things that always happen or things that are important to happen in certain ways um, that are part of these spaces. Many of them have some aspect of community experience, whether it's a bunch of individuals are all having the same experience, or a group of people together are having some community place or experience that they do together in the same period of time, right? So the community experience could be synchronous or asynchronous. Um, now that we've got Zoom in our repertoire, we know that sometimes those spaces aren't always physical, and we can share space even if it's virtual. Often there's some aspect of contemplation where there's time or space to think about whether that's past or future or present. And again, that's usually related to worship. And sometimes it's related to ritual where there's a very designated amount of time for contemplation. Many of these have an aspect of pilgrimage where you go and seek something out or maybe I could maybe broaden that and say intentionality. So even in the home altar setups, you've chosen those things and there's a, a certain um, sequence that you're setting up that the pilgrimage, and there's some very famous pilgrimage sites where there's um, each stop along a sometimes um, you know, month-long journey to get to somewhere um, is also part of a sacred experience until you get to the final, um, final place. Um, there's also the whether something historically has happened there in the Bible or, or Quran or other um, documents that have designated a site as a place where something happened. 
or an object that was present at the time or an artifact related to a holy figure or a, um, something that has um, been blessed or somehow elevated. Right? So these are the functional things that is, are part of sacred spaces. So if you're designing one from scratch, for example, you would be asking these questions around what is the nature of the um, things that have to happen. And so the forms that come out of it are related to you know, how do you support those functions. And so quite often there's some kind of connection to nature or cosmos. And that can be a room that has no views, but is somehow oriented on cardinal directions. Or it could be that the views are blocked from the everyday um, experience and directed upwards or downwards. Right? And so the idea of being somehow connected beyond the actual thing that you're in is a common um, element in sacred spaces. The quality of light, I think, is really, again, if you um, think of the, all the sacred spaces that you had in your own slideshow and others that were in the images I showed you, um, the quality of light is, um, you could describe it, right? It's not generic, it's not banal. There's usually something pretty intense about it. And that can be super bright or super dim, right? Or very focused or uh, diffused in another way. But light is often a, a really important aspect for a designer, for example, to think about when they're thinking what forms of sacred spaces support which functions. And acoustics are critically important because so much of the worship or the ritual have to do with someone speaking or singing or bells ringing or things that have to do with sound, right? So chants or other types of things that either echo or muffle. So the acoustics of a space, not that you couldn't reuse a space that wasn't intended for a certain acoustical use for a sacred space, but many sacred spaces that are purpose-built um, have some uh, quality of uh, acoustic attention. There's usually some uh, pretty clear reason for why an axis is set up, either a long um, aisle or crossing, or uh, even if it's a meandering path, there may be some alignments. Sometimes those are uh, to the cosmos, um, to Mecca, to the North Star, to the sun rising, um, and they often are tied to liturgy of stories or something about that deeper worship or honoring. Um, and then the placement of sacred objects, if there is a sacred object, is often the focal point or something that, again, axes might line up to. So the forms themselves in, in supporting the functions in sacred spaces um, usually take into account those things. What might vary a great deal, though, is whether or not that the scale of the space is meant to accommodate individuals who come and pray on their own and then you know, go through and have that more internal experience that they are collectively having but in different time periods, right? So over time, many people go through and they might offer an individual prayer versus a, um, a culture where the, it's important to actually have everybody together doing things at the same time in the same space, right? So that can be a major difference in the cultural um, needs for what a sacred space does. And the meaning associated with the axes I was talking about, whether that's lineal or concentric um, or even radial or spiraling, um, that meaning, again, tied to the stories or to the honoring of whatever the worship uh, ritual is, uh, can be radically different. So what is respectful in one sacred space might be disrespectful or um, really uh, prosaic in, in another. And that has to do sometimes with the, this orientation around the cardinal points, um, mecca or uh, energetic forces. And then the geometry and symbolism can, again, there are times where architects have had real problems where they've chosen a symbol that they think is universal and is actually not from the culture or means something quite negative in a culture, right? So the, the symbolic meaning of shapes and forms, materials, choices of materials, as well as things like triangles and arrows and stars and circles um, can all have a really um, 
deep meaning, and sometimes it's contradictory, right? Where in history you look up at, and find that this was sacred, and then also then find later it was rejected by another group coming in. So the, the layers of history can alter the meanings of these geometries. But the idea that geometry could be sacred or could be spiritual has um, is definitely permeated in a lot of um, design of sacred space and use of sacred space. So I'm gonna go through some examples here to try to make things a little bit more concrete. I just had a bunch of words on the on the screen just now. So um, I'm not Catholic, I was not raised Catholic, um, but in the Catholic Church, uh, Vatican II, which was in 1962, was a, a really major shift in um, updating the church for a more secular role, more relevancy. Um, and among the many, many changes that were made, some churches then wanted to change the placement of the altar and the direction that the priest faced. So the orientation to the cross, which was typically placed to the east or the rising, um, was maintained to welcome that rising of, the, of Christ. But it was controversial in the 60s and remains actually controversial today. So facing the congregation was seen by some as being more accessible. You can make eye contact with the parishioners. But by others is actually less accessible because I'm not praying with you. I'm actually um, speaking in as God's representative, right? So depending on where you fall in that, um, within, again, the, the single um, unifying uh, liturgy of the Catholic Church, there's a lot of controversy about whether the um, ad orientum or, or ad uh, versus populum uh, orientation is the better one or the one that most reflects the values of the church or the goals of uh, inviting people to worship and, and, and elevating their, their spirits. Oops. Okay, and when I think about, again, some of those forms and axes, um, I think of a really famous example of axes in Asia as the Forbidden City, um, which was the seat of the divine emperor um, and was oriented on a north-south axis which then guided the layout of the entire region. And so the forbidden city itself is part of a larger imperial city, which is part of the, um, again, the uh, inner and outer city, and really even today is organizing principle for the, the Beijing airport, which wasn't there at the time that the forbidden city was, was made. And they even changed landforms to create a more dominant, um, uh, reason why this north-south axis would make sense. So this was really um, kind of not only the seat of power, but also the seat of this uh, kind of sacred divine um, emperor. So the axial circulation was emphasized, uh, emphasized the power structure where the some of the doorways that you would um, think would, you know, are right on axis there um, only some people could go through certain doors, so there would be side doors. So, you know, depending on the nature of the procession and who was in it, um, some people would be split off to go through side doors and some would be allowed to go through the middle. Um, and the scale, of course, uh, was, and actually still is, if you've been there, quite intimidating. Um, and so just walking along the axis, it's not like a narrow axis where you know where you're going, but yet it's an enormous space, but very clearly there is a line through it. So the structure of the buildings and the symbolism of the, orient on the ornamentation um, all emphasize this axis of power. Right? So some of the largest buildings have the most number of um, ornaments that line the edges of the roof eaves, for example. Um, and some of these were, again, reserved that you couldn't have more than or be taller than um, the, the, the seat of the emperor where the more ceremonial spaces were. So I thought in closing it might be interesting for you to see these axes from an artist's eye. And so this is uh, paintings of my mother that uh, is part of the book, if you've been able to pick that up. Um, and I, in that book I have an essay about her joyful eye and her training in both Western and Eastern methods um, that I, I find evident in her work. And so she would, um, she lived in Asia, well, grew up, born and raised in Asia, and then left for uh, college in America, and then uh, after many, many years, went back to uh, live in Hong Kong and travel through Asia. 
and did many paintings that she would do um, in situ. So the watercolor on the left would be done um, on a little stool with a tiny little paint, paint box um, in, the, in the place, uh, and then come back to her studio in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and, um, or in this case was in Hong Kong, um, to do these larger paintings, um, uh, often months or years after the sketch that was um, that inspired it. Um, so again, the axis or being off axis, um, and again, you see some of the ornament of the um, the number of figures that line the edge of that roof eave being um, symbolic of the emperor and the um, the use of power again. And then also just to uh, show you some examples that this is not the Forbidden City. So these are temples in Hong Kong that are, are really integrated into neighborhoods. And so this is showing how worship in the case of the um, these Buddhist traditions are really integrated into the daily lives um, and neighborhoods. So this is the kind of asynchronous where lots of people pass through these places, but they do it on their own time. And they will offer, um, you know, similarly offer uh, um, incense or, or um, artifacts that get burned. Um, so these temples are, uh, I, I showed some photographs, and then these are the um, paintings that were done in situ when she went to go visit. Um, and some of these are in, um, around, in and around Hong Kong. And some have been recreated, so this one on the upper right um, was actually moved several times. And so, you know, in various times in, um, in China, Buddhism has gone underground or been more celebrated. And so there have been times where these temples have been moved and some of them uh, are just by their name moved. Sometimes there's objects that move with it. Um, and some are more museum-like and some are, uh, are, are situated into the um, neighborhood where people still pray. And so the altar pieces and the um, elements and uh, you know red being very prominent um, as a color and gold also being very prominent, um, but the kind of mix of uh, dragons and um, and uh, sometimes warriors are all kind of uh, wonderfully mixed up into the um, what the neighborhood kind of temples might consider to be sacred. So those are the slides that I brought for you today. Hopefully introduce some ways of thinking about sacred space that are helpful for you. So uh, if we can get Dan to come on up and we can have a discussion. Thank you so much for that thought-provoking and informative talk and the takedown on this sacred spaces around Asia. I'm sure there are some questions. Um, Diane has joined us on the table. So you could raise your hand, and if you have a piece of paper that you have written down the question, you could just wave at us, and we'll collect it. And uh, we'll just repeat the question since this recording, um, we're, like, we're recording the lecture. We'll just hand it over to you, Diane and Renee. Thank you. Can we get the Thank slides you. off? I don't think we need them. They're kind of blinding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Renee. That was wonderful. Um, you just gave us such a visual treat. Um, it was a special treat to see your mom's amazing paintings in this context, especially of thinking about sacred architecture. Um, and also, you gave us a really rich um, index, in a way, of how to think about mm -hmm. sacred spaces. So as I'm trying to think about this, and you know, as I as I was preparing for for this this day, I was thinking back to um, a time long, long ago when I had the opportunity to interact with architecture students, very young architecture students, and they often wanted to find a way to make meaning in architecture, yeah. and they would say. I've designed this and people will move into the space and they will feel this. And I would often think, hmm, but will they? <laughs> and so I wondered 
what you, how you might just start us off by thinking about that. I'm, I'm imagining that when an architect is given the charge of creating a sacred space, that must be primary in their minds. How, how can one uh, try to direct feeling right. in the space when, as you showed us, there's so much diversity in, in the ways that we understand the sacred? So yeah, I, th I do think that architects, especially when they're in school and they're new to design and the, the discipline of design, um, will often overestimate the power of architecture, their, their power as a designer to dictate what's going to happen in the spaces. Um, additionally, we know that many spaces today are reused or adapted from their original intended use. So there's a lot of variables that happen between the designer's concept and the, what actually happens. And I think that more experienced designers, as you get farther along, you know, when you're a student in school, you don't often get to talk to anybody who it's it's a hypothetical project. Uh, you're not necessarily talking to people that even hypothetically would be using the spaces. So you're relying a lot on your own memories or even your classmates or your instructor. And so there's so many assumptions that are built into that. Um, but when you think about the connection between space and behavior, you can dictate what people uh, how people move at least, right? And so, but you can also, I, I probably you can all have been in spaces that are really frustrating, right? And so the designer did not probably intend for you to be frustrated because what was happening probably is that your natural way of wanting to move was not being supported because the designer didn't realize people would want to come from here to there, right? And so, and I'm sorry, but I, I know there were probably good reasons for not having a stair here, but it's, it's unusual, so I'm using it as an example, but it's, it, I'm sure they, they're making it work, right? But um, so the, the feelings that you try to evoke in your building users as a designer, and a lot of times the design of a build, the separation in time between the design when it's an actual building um, and the actual users are centuries, right? So you might not even be alive when the users of your building are hopefully feeling or experiencing the things that you intended them to do. And so how do you anticipate as a designer the kinds of uh, generational changes that are going to happen with, um, you know, you, you all have been in older houses that don't have enough um, electrical outlets, right? Because you didn't really need that many, right? And now you need uh, tons and tons of them for all our devices and charging and things like that, right? Or places where uh, the, the you know beautiful office spaces flooded with light that don't work for computer screens, right? And so there's lots and lots of times where just because things change as the designer is trying to anticipate, but you can say there are some universals, right? That there are times where light is powerful and whether or not it's symbolically more light is better or controlled light is better, right? That can be quite variable, but light and acoustics and material choices and thermal comfort are lasting and powerful. So if you're able to understand that and keep respecting that, and then if you can have the ability to contact people that might even hypothetically be the types of building users that are not yourself. I find a lot of times architecture students are thinking a lot of their own experiences, which is what they have to draw from. And so the more we can expose them to other experiences, you know, the, the better they are as designers and the more they stretch their skills as designers. That's, that's so crucial, I think it's so interesting. In what you showed us, there's a kind of an ongoing tension between what's very personal in particular, and what's in some ways um, a bit universal. Right. And I was thinking about how, you know, through, when you showed us those wonderful, um, the grid of images that you did through Google searches, um, there's, there are certain continuities through time. Um, you know, the interest in finding a way to, well, first of all, I think one of the key connectors is, these are all places that um, ask us to think about our existence. Um, where we come from, where we go when we are no more, um, and uh, that in many cultures try to make some sort of, you talked about the vertical axis connecting an underworld to a heaven, a heavenly world. Um, in other instances, uh, kind of uh, more direct horizontal axes that connect a user to a sacred object. But there are these seeming universals that are so interesting and I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about how architects think about those universals. Are they, are they in this lexicon or are there other sort of 
for an architect sitting down and designing a sacred space, um, and someone asked, how much of it is it about naming the sacred space? So that's yeah. one of our questions. Um, how do they think about things like words in the space? Or you know, to let people know that signal as well as the material dimensions that you've been talking about. Right, so I think that architects do think about what tools they have to work with that have to do with um, the geometry and the dimensions of a space, the material of a space. Also things like the axes, like if you uh, are in a long sloped ramp versus a monumental stair, right? Your experience is different, what's going through your, your mind is different. There's actually super interesting work that's been happening around the neuroscience of connection of space to neuroscience and what gets triggered um, either universally or based on your culture of what spaces can um, trigger more peaceful calm or more stress. And so there's, and a lot of that work is feeding into healthcare settings in particular, uh, where it's really critical if you can find a way to lower stress by the healthcare provider or by the patients, um, that can be a really, you know, it, or if you're ignoring that, it's a tool that you're not using in trying to heal someone or, or um, help them uh, regain their health. So I think architects do think about it, and it, it gets pretty complex where, again, as the, the someone new to design is perfectly happy to make a lot of assumptions and not even think too much about them, right? And say, well, if people don't know this is the exit, I'm just going to put a big sign, and that'll tell you where the exit is, right? And uh, as you get more experience with design, you see precedents, first of all, of like, how did, that, how did that work that people just knew that was the exit, right? Like, what, what were the cues that seemed to work really well in a really elegant way that was just by material choice? Like, if that door was painted red, right, like, that would be a different type of thing. Maybe we wouldn't need a sign, but, you know, legally you need a sign, right? But um, the type, you start to get a broader palette of what can work to guide this behavior. And then as you get, I think, even more experience, you start to even question that and say, okay, well, but that's what I think, but is that what other people will think or what future people will think? Right? So you actually start to question, so you get less confident as you get more skilled and see more things and see how different, um, so many different choices, you actually then start to say, okay, some of this is a little arbitrary and maybe my personal choice or my preference or what I've seen work. And some of it might come from something someone said to me in this user group of uh, this is what I uh, have seen in the past or, or prefer to do. So it gets pretty complicated, but I do think that you know what we try to teach our students is um, you know things like proportion, which are really, really old fashioned, right? Like that was something that architects have paid attention to for a really long time. Um, and there were, you know, things like the golden section and, and certain numerical ways of generating that you can now program into computers to do for you. But the idea that proportion matters and that uh, the same volume of space can feel totally different if it's like a tiny little square space that's really, really tall versus a big broad space with a really low ceiling, right? That they have the same volume, but they are experienced totally differently. Like, so we, we do, there are things that we can teach students and designers do keep in mind, but it, it's a wonderful, complicated field where you can't always have a, a clear connection between my intention is this and this is how what you're going to feel or, or behave like. Yeah, absolutely, and you, you just referenced the complexity of all of this, so I'm going to add another dimension of complexity for yeah. one of our <laughs> questions from the audience. Um, this is, how has the use of technology with respect to surveillance changed the way architects are thinking about buildings as spaces for observation? That's a mm. great question. It is a great question, and actually it's coming into play a lot in cities, um, and the city of Seattle has been debating this for a long time, as many cities are, um, around cameras and surveillance, and many of you maybe seen stories around um, you know, the number of cameras in China, for example, versus here, and the, the number of things that have cameras in it that can be accessed, um, that there's really a uh, huge escalation in at least the public awareness of the surveillance capacity of technologies that we even have now, right? And so, um, and some of that's coming through, you know, pop culture, like you, some of the heist movies where it's like, oh, grab the camera from the ATM and then get the one from the traffic thing, you know? And so, and some of that's, Hollywood, and some of that's real. <laughs> and so um, I think that the ways that we, um, and I alluded to it earlier with the advent of us all being more familiar with online ways of um, sharing space together, 
that the idea that we have to be this close to each other to share space or for me to see you um, brings up whole other issues around privacy where it used to be I could know that you all are looking at me, right? But if I leave a camera on a meeting and I feel like I've signed out and people are actually still seeing me, right? Like those kinds of things happen all the time now where they used to be much more in a fully analog world. So as architects and primarily city planners, I think have been using, have been struggling a lot with this question. Um, there are some good things about being able to provide information when you need it. And there's times where you can say that there's, um, again, going back to some healthcare settings, uh, real benefit to being able to um, not have to physically be in all the places to be able to see what's going on in those places. There are sensors, it's not always cameras, right? So there are sensors also um, where there are times where it can be really beneficial, where you can um, have in heating and cooling systems, for example, the ability to uh, recapture excess heat because you're seeing that this is an unoccupied room so you can let the temperature rise. And you know, so there's a number of things that could actually be really beneficial, um, but it does provide another um, whole dimension around privacy, around uh, our intuitive understandings of, of space and what we design uh, with the systems that are embedded into the, the walls and spaces that we're, we're experiencing today. That's fascinating, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things I'm really struck by when I think about the sacred spaces from deep into uh, human history, as well as some of those that are part of our, our, li our lives now, is the way is the role that landscape and nature plays in those spaces. When I closed my eyes, I have to tell you, I did think of some architectural spaces, but I also thought of spaces yeah. in the woods or by a lake. And you and I talked a little bit about this the other day. And I was thinking too about how spaces like Stonehenge, we know were meant to be moved through, that you know stupas are meant to be circumambulated, that there's movement through and in space. And I, I wondered if you could talk about the role of landscape um, in sacred space and, and how architects and landscape architects may be thinking about that and working together on those questions now. Yeah, so when you think about landscape, so I would make a distinction for the purposes of answering this question at least, of uh, truly natural spaces that are untouched and those that are um, affected by some kind of man-made intention. Um, and so there are fewer and fewer of the untouched spaces, but there are some that are close approximations or have been designated as not to be um, altered, right? And there's you know debates you can get into of how much is climate affecting some of those things that anyway. But um, you know if you think about the nature of being in a bamboo forest or near the redwoods, right? The grandeur is clearly something spiritual or beyond ourselves, And it was something you mentioned in one of the questions earlier about the commonality that happens where we seem to be seeking something out of our everyday. And so there are ways obviously of making your everyday beautiful and uh, comfortable and um, spirit elevating. But quite often we wish to be taken out of our everyday because when we get into our everyday, we stop seeing things, right? Like you, you might not be able to tell me how many steps uh, go up to your front door, right? Because you've done it so many times, but you don't trip, right? And so, but you've forgotten because it's just been so ingrained into your habit. And so there's some good things about that, but there's also you're not as aware, right? So that's often why we travel or why we go to places that are designated. But there are times where you're in a, uh, so landscape that has been formed um, is usually formed for a variety of reasons, just like architecture is, right? It's not just for the person, it's also for the water or the erosion or the plants or the ecosystems or the flora and fauna, right? So there's many reasons why landscape looks the way it does. And sometimes you can read that and sometimes you can't. Sometimes that's really celebrated and sometimes it's just kind of taken care of for you, right? So, but I, I think the role of landscapes, I mean, I, I would say also when, um, and you know, I should have just done a Google search for it, right? Because I often, many of the spaces where I have felt the most um, spiritually expansive were outdoors or natural spaces that were actually not formed by uh, any sort of intention by a person. So I think that the, um, 
And there's actually a lot written around the connection of, say, healing gardens and the spirituality and uh, living, living um, species and water. And you know, so I think that there's quite a large body of literature over many years around the potential for natural elements to do things that um, geometric and other types of clearly man-made cannot do. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm just thinking as you're talking about, I was mentioning to Renee the other day, one of my favorite spaces. Oh, great. Present, yeah. Thank you. One of my favorite spaces is in a, a cemetery outside of Stockholm called the Woodland Cemetery that was designed by uh, two architects, uh, As Asplund and Leverance. And in the Woodland Chapel, which is in kind of out in a more distant part of the cemetery in a forest, the architect simply took a tree that was cut, it was logged, and laid it down as a beam at the top of the roof, right? So that it's as though this, this wonderful thing that kind of represents a human form is just laid, laid down, yeah. laid to rest. And that's right. just sort of one of these ways of architecture and landscape talking to each other right. that's sort of fascinating. Yeah. Let me read some questions. Okay, so here it says, um, in a secular society like ours, what resources do architects have to convey a sense of the sacred and is it still possible? You've answered some of that. I yeah. don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Um, yeah. I mean, I think um, I'm involved with, um, and I, I think this was on the blog, I'm involved with a group called the Nehemiah Initiative, which is a group of churches in the Central District that were historically black but have been losing their congregation and their land value has gone up, but their congregation is small and their buildings are um, not in good repair. And so they've been trying to figure out how to develop their, um, their land and their churches. And so we've had discussions around the... Um, you know, the worship space, which is full on Sundays or, you know, mostly full on Sundays and then not as full on the rest of the uh, rest of the days of the week. And so the, the, how they think, and these are church elders that I'm talking to from a variety of different denominations, um, their idea of what, where God is or where beloved community is, is not just in the worship space, right? It's, it's community spaces, it's housing. Right, and so they have a really different idea of what their role is, and I think when um, so we have architecture students, real estate students, landscape students, um, urban design students working with these communities, um, and I think it's really helpful for them. So that's a, a different thing than sacred, right? It's faith-based, right? So a faith-based community has a role in secular society, and it has a role that um, has to do with spaces and places and services that are supported by those spaces. So I think that there's still a great need for um, supporting communities that are seeing their needs change. I also do think that, you know, we've talked before about, you know, what is this uh, human desire to connect to something bigger? You know, whether it's the cosmos, whether it's, you know, some, some kind of energy or spirituality. Um, and I think that that's still present. And some of that is harder to do online than it is in any physical place. And so I would say, you know, there is a pretty strong interest in, and it's never really gone away. It's sometimes been organized in faith-based communities. And then other times, and I think today is one of those times where um, if, you, if you look at how many um, ways people are seeking something bigger, and whether it's um, some kind of fitness type thing that gets you into a different, you know, mind space, or whether it's uh, using aromatherapy, or you know, there's there's just all kinds of things that that purport to bring you to some other place. And I think it's because of this this real hunger for um, connecting to something bigger. Absolutely. This, the, and here's another really great question that I also was thinking of as you were speaking, asking about the role that materials and really objects play in creating space. Um, are objects and materials empty vessels uh, to be filled by cultural meaning, or do they have an agency of their own? So important in some of the things you yeah, showed us. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's a, um, I don't think I would be able to say I have the answer to that, right? Um, I think that, you know, obviously based on my talk, I, I think that very few things in this, in this uh, universe are, are um, neutral. Right, that there's uh, meaning and uh, the idea of an empty vessel or a blank slate um, is really a fallacy because it's, there's always a history, there's always um, something, even if it's coming from you, uh, seeing something that you're, you're imbuing or having some reaction to it, 
that has to do with um, things beyond the, the molecules and the atoms that make up the, the thing itself. Um, and, and then, but then you also come to the more um, maybe objective way of answering that where, you know, there are acoustic properties that are different with wood versus stone, right? And so, um, and they have different thermal properties. They have different expansion properties. And so if you, if you put um, wood and stone or steel and wood, the, over time the wood might expand if it's, if it's uh, the humidity is rising, right? So there's certain things you have to respect just about the material science of the differences in materials, right? And there are some wood that is much more difficult to carve than others. There are ceramics that are um, have to be fired at certain temperatures or react in different ways with different, you know, glazes if they're in different temperatures, right? So sometimes if you know more about it, you would see it, let's say, a piece in this museum, and if you know about, say, Raku firing versus porcelain, you would say, oh, that's amazing. They were able to get that effect using this other firing um, technique, right? Or you might say, oh, that's, that's um, I like the dark shaded part on this, on this vessel the way it is, right? So depending on how much you yourself know, and sometimes it has to do with the didactics of what's been explained to you in a museum setting, for example. Um, but, you know, I've just been recently this summer going through a lot of uh, things of my mother's and my, my dad and childhood things, and, and you've got these objects in your hand, and it's triggering all these memories from you. And you're like, okay, do I keep it? Do I throw it away? Do I put it in the trash? Do I give it away? And so clearly objects <laughs> have a lot of meaning. And it's very rarely that you can just say, oh yeah, throw it away, I don't care. Right? There's usually always a decision, even if it's a hard one, that there's some meaning here to me um, that potentially someone else who sees it, if you give it away at a thrift store, may, you know, it may resonate with them, or it may just be like, oh, I need a thing that does this, right? You know, so. Yeah, no, it's true, and I mean, it kind of connects to this next question, where somebody's asking about, I think they're asking about auras, and they said, um, you mentioned mm -hmm. light and acoustics, among other properties, uh, yes, properties, but many sacred spaces also have an unmistakable aura. Yeah. Um, you might call it a power for some places, and objects yeah. too, you sort of mentioned that. Yeah. You know, how, how do you think architects think about that? Is that something that factors in, or is that too intangible for architectural well, practice? Well, so um, architect, Western architects, I think, are less comfortable trying to tap that, right? I think even if they believe it happens, it tends to be something like somehow this, this happens with certain alignments of things, right? But um, in feng shui, it's, it's pretty much that, right? It's like there are these spirits and they move in these ways and you block them or you invite them in, right? And there's like books and books and books written and uh, diagrams and kind of dimensions and it's like spelled out. Here's how to <laughs> capture the good spirits and keep the bad spirits away, right? So there's, a, in Chinese culture, feng shui is completely based on the spirits move and energy flows or gets blocked and it relates also to Tai Chi and a lot of you know, things that you try to keep energy moving within your own body, within your, the rooms and even how you set things up. And so um, you know, depending on the, the culture, it is sometimes mystical and sometimes it's quite practical. Like if you look at a lot of the feng shui principles, you know, it's like you locate the um, smelly things downwind. Right? It's like, that's a good idea. <laughs> and then things that create uh, potential um, harmful things to humans in water are located downhill, right? So like, there's certain like, super practical health kind of things that are happening, um, but they're explained in ways that also have to do with energy flow and kind of the keeping the, the spirits being able to move and not be trapped. I think that's actually one of the one of the kind of um, often overlooked aspects of a lot of sacred space and, and spiritual experience spaces is the ways that they do collect, connect very practical concerns with very yeah. deeply spiritual concerns. Um, it's sort yeah. of fascinating to think at their, about that. At their best, they're doing multiple things and they do align, which then brings you back to, is there some harmonic or is there some kind of larger truth, right, which is a where some of the golden section stuff came from, right? You know, and the, acoustically there are things that work about that, right? And if you then go back to analyze a lot of natural forms of shells, it's there, right? So are there certain things that, um, that resonate in ways that are universal? I mean, I think that's actually one of the really fascinating things that you've brought to light here is the ways that as an architect, 
you're able to, and it shows also the, the really incredible complexity of architectural practice, right? That you have to know these, you have to know these historical dimensions. You have to be able to consider the social aspects of many different cultural uh, modes of thinking about the sacred. But you also have this myriad sort of uh, array of deeply technical concerns that you have to also kind of weave in that can either enhance or terribly detract from that sacred experience. Right. It's really fascinating what you've yeah. shared. Um, this is a very practical pedagogical question for okay. you. Um, are there small exercises that lead students to discover various ways to infuse meaning beyond aesthetic that would prep them for larger projects? Any ideas, please? Ah, okay, this is great because I'm, I'm prepping to, to teach a class. I'm actually not teaching a basic design class. I haven't taught one in a long time. Um, but we do do exercises that try to take, um, one of the, the things you do when a student comes in, they'll often have very predetermined ideas of what is a house, right? And so if you assign them to um, design a house, you'll get a fairly normative, often pitch roof, or like a super modern um, kind of house. But if you say, uh, design a space for eating, right? That's gonna be probably more thought provoking to them than a dining room, right? And so, um, or a dine, design a space for sleeping, right? So some of it is just how you frame a, the, the program brief or the assignment. But we also do some super abstract things like paper folding, right? With three folds of paper, create something that encompasses as much volume as you can or that is directional. Right? And so it, it brings the students into a purely geometrical, formal way of looking at things. Um, and then, then you can say, well, things that are linear have these certain qualities, right? And so then you can go to history and show precedence, and they can see, okay, I did this simple paper folding, which is not a building. It's not even a space for dining or passage or anything. But when I look at these other historical examples of linear spaces, I can see why this is really different than my classmate who went with a more centralized space, right? So you go back to some really principal, um, basic principles about you know linear versus concentric or radial and start to talk about some of the geometric properties of things and then tie them as quickly as you can so that it doesn't become only that. Um, you very early on say, okay, so you've made this thing that operates in this way geometrically, but now socially or how it would be occupied by multiple people versus a single person and then light and acoustics and the technical stuff. So we actually don't hold back that much with students, or I don't, where we, we do actually throw a lot at them, but what we actually are trying to do is strip away the kind of iconic idea of a house where they're not thinking anymore about you know what is the dwelling part and where is the door, and they're just saying, oh, well, the door's here because that's where what houses do, right? So it is stripping away, but then it's also you know, making them see the level of complexity and not, um, not oversimplifying, uh, which, so they get used to that they're dealing with multiple things. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing I've been thinking about as we've been talking is that there's a specific kind of sacred architecture that we've seen, I think, more of being built in the United States maybe over the past 20 years, um, and that's memorials. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about the way, one of my uh, teachers way back was an architectural historian named Spiro Kostov. And he talked about memorials um, and the design of memorials as being a way that those are sites that can ease trauma into memory. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that um, we do is, we find ways to do as humans in many different ways, but I do think that that's one of the things that memorial sites help us to do. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how architects um, in current practice might be thinking about that kind of spiritual yeah. or sacred, it's, they really yeah. are incredibly sacred spaces often. Right, and they're actually, they've historically been a really um, important part of architectural education and, and kind of been the career making thing for many, like Maya Lin, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the traditional Western way was a, a, a statue mm -hmm. of a person with names Right, so that, or plaques with names, right? So that was uh, the way that memorials were set up for, for many centuries. And so when Maya Lin inverted that for the Vietnam War Memorial, um, and one of the most radical things that she did was um, most of those plaques are um, alphabetical by last name. Mm 
Um, and what she proposed, which was hugely controversial at the time, was uh, chronological, based on the date of death. And so, um, and if you've gone to that memorial, you'll see what happens is that as people find their loved ones' names, other loved ones that are um, also looking, their, um, their soldiers might have died in the same battle, right, or on the, in the same period of time in the war. Right, so that was a completely different way of organizing the names. But the names were still there, right? And so there are times where um, an architectural solution is based on just even taking some of those same elements of the names, um, but organizing them in a different way. And there's lots of other amazing things about that memorial. There's little details about the, the edge um, of where the wall meets the ground and how the water is taken off but, and keeps you away but allows you to touch and just the height of it and the alignment with the monuments and everything. So there's a lot of things about that memorial that are well studied and incredibly well, um, well designed. Um, but then you also have, um, there's uh, the lynching memorial which was uh, recently got a lot of press and a great award by Mass Design. Um, that are marking not the sacrifice of, of, of many individuals like the, the like a war memorial, but of a terrible time in history. And um, then there's I think the one of those the flags that are in Washington D.C. for the COVID memorial. Um, there really wasn't a lot of time or space. There were so many um, so many things we lost during the pandemic, including many people couldn't have funerals for those that died during that time, either from COVID or other reasons. And so that memorial of the flags, just to see the numbers, and I haven't been myself, but I've seen photographs of it, and the numbers are uh, overwhelming, right? And so there's a beauty to it, but then there's also this kind of important role of marking and being able to come to grips somehow with numbers or with events. Right, and um, move somehow, honor them, even if we're not trying to correct them or um, move on, right? It's somehow incorporating them into our human lives and human Remember. history that quite, and I think the COVID memorial one was not designed by an architect, it was designed by an artist, right? So your times where what is an architect doing versus a sculptor um, or an a artist that works in you know, multimedia or other, other um, Media, so it's it's not always the role of an architect or a landscape architect, but it often will involve something that lasts and something physical, um, and so I think that that's a wider open field of what disciplines are being brought to bear and what kinds of lenses are being brought to bear. There's a lot of great um, collaborations between landscape architects, architects, and artists with the 9/11, um, and you know many many examples. But those are uh, contemporary. There aren't that many new cathedrals being built, right? right? but there are definitely um, many more consistently over the history memorials that are being built and some quite contemporary and they are the source of quite a lot of uh, rightly so attention. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder if there's a sort of a, a shift to, to a need for public mourning and spirituality yeah. away yeah. from a particular religion, but I, I'm yeah. I'm way out of my depth on that. <laughs> um, one last question for you, I think, before, and if there's any from the audience, I'm happy to take more questions, but um, what is your favorite sacred space? Oh, gosh, I guess I should have been prepared for that question. <laughs> so um, I would say, well, we were just talking about the James Terrell. There's a little um, room in the Henry Art Museum. If you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend going. Um, and all of James Terrell's spaces, and some of this has to do with, you know, when I was very early in my, um, as an architecture student, I really came much more from an art background. So a lot of the architecture um, aspects, especially the technical ones, were, were harder for me to understand. Um, and I saw a lecture by James Terrell, and he talked about finding, um, he actually built walls on roller skates, like he, he got his daughter's roller skates, and he, he built this wall with a, cut out in it and he, um, and he was lighting it and he was moving the wall and he was trying to find the place where the space thickens. And that um, lecture, and it was when I was struggling myself as an art, like architect artist type of thing, and his whole lecture was just really moving to me. And then so um, there's a space in Minneapolis where I used to live, uh, another sky room. So he's done a series of sky rooms. And I find all of them are incredible and, and I'll 
sit in them as the light is changing at um, sunset, and or different like in the rain or in Minneapolis in the snow. Um, and they they really do something for me that helps like loosen the kind of knot that can get can arise in my chest sometimes when things are just hard. Um, and so for me, those are are really important spaces. Excellent, thank you. Any final questions from the audience? Be happy to take. Very Great. good. Well, I don't know if there's mo more books in the back, Haley, but there's um, some that p feel welcome to um, take those. And there's uh, some of my mom's work I showed you, but there's a wide range of things. She spent some time in Italy, and um, and the essay again, as I said, it describes her her path from uh, Eastern to Western to back to Eastern. <laughs> so. Well, Renee, thank, thank you all very much. Thank, thank you, you so Diane. much. So, Wonderful. So. And thank you, Haley and the Sam team.